John, 911, what's the location of your emergency? Sandy Hook Elementary School, 12 Dickinson Drive. Okay, I've got that. What's going on down there? This, I believe they're shooting at the front at the front glass. Something's okay. going on. All right, I've got all, I want you to stand in line with me. Where are you in the school? I think there's somebody shooting in here at Sandy Hook School. Okay, what makes you think that? Because somebody's got a gun. I saw a glimpse of somebody. They're running down the hallway. Okay, well, the majority of those who died today were children. Sandy Hook School, please beautiful little kids between the ages of five and ten years old. We realized immediately, I mean once I got there, we, I, I myself knew pretty much what was going on. We didn't have specific details yet. Negative on description. Okay, shots were fired about three minutes ago. Quiet at the time. New town's reporting. One suspect down. The building has not been cleared. That comes to the base of the school. Not, I'll be here right at the base. we got to get injured parties out. We'll start getting them out. It was a very tragic, um, you know, observation on, on all parts uh, because then you could see the carnage that was uh, present. As 2012 was coming to an end, the United States of America was ready to put the year behind them. And after suffering from the 12th deadliest shooting ever recorded in the country at that point, the Aurora Movie Theatre Massacre, which shook the nation, I don't think anyone was prepared for what was about to happen on one morning in December. As residents of Newtown, Connecticut were preparing for the Christmas holiday and the eventual New Year, an incident was about to occur at the Sandy Hook Elementary School, which until this day remains the deadliest mass shooting event to take Take place at an elementary school in America. 20 children aged 6 and 7 years old were gunned down in their classroom by a complete stranger who had many years before attended the school himself, 20-year-old Adam Lanza. He would go on to take the lives of not only those innocent souls but the souls of innocent teachers and his mother before proceeding to take his own life. Ladies and gentlemen, today we look into the devastating case of the Sandy Hook Elementary School mass shooting. For many of you, you'll be familiar with this case and the unanswered questions surrounding a motive, but information that has been uncovered over this past year or so by people over on Reddit may point us in a general direction to theorize what led to this awful event. Although I must emphasize that the recent YouTube channel, which has been claimed to be that of Adam Lanza's, can't be verified. On the 22nd of April 1992, Adam Peter Lanza was born to parents, Peter and Nancy, in the town of Exeter, New Hampshire. And to say the family were well off was an understatement. Adam had been born into a family home built by his parents, located within farmland that was owned by his grandparents. High school sweethearts, Peter and Nancy, had tied the knot some years prior, and after having their first son, Adam's older brother, Ryan Lanza, Nancy knew she wanted to build a property within her family's land so they could settle down for the decades to come. However, all wouldn't go to plan when Adam was born. You see, Nancy had dropped out of university after the pair had placed long-term bets on Peter's career. They couldn't both afford to go to university, a move that she would call her biggest regret in life as the years passed. So while he attended university, she picked up various jobs, including starting her own business at a laundry. Eventually, though, she sold the laundry and got an office job with a life insurance company. Peter's father was a legendary salesman and investment broker with the company, which gave Nancy an edge in securing the job. Coming full circle then, and with her first pregnancy, Nancy was able to make the 50-mile trip to work with no problems. But with Adam, her blood sugar would plummet, throwing her off balance. Then waves of nausea came, increasing in frequency and intensity the more she tried to power through it. This in turn would see her performance decline at work, and eventually she was granted five months medical leave until until Adam was born. Within those five months, the firm were planning to restructure Nancy's department, meaning cutting costs and cutting jobs. Nancy was told she wasn't going to lose her job, but she had nothing to worry about. But one day, after the birth of Adam, that dreadful letter came through the door, and that was it. She had two children to take care of, and no job. Luckily though, Peter, by this point, had finished university, and was the vice president at an asset management firm, so money wasn't an issue. For the first three years of Adam's life, he didn't speak. Reports say he even babbled, and made noises that sounded like
like words, but not words that anyone would understand. Within the family, it became accepted that he was, quote, making up his own language. Over Adam's younger years, Nancy had been in touch with various child-related services in relation to this issue. And just prior to preschool, it was determined that Adam demonstrated a good attention span coupled with creative playing skills. However, they didn't understand anything he was saying. By the time late 95 swung around, Adam had resorted into full muteness after medical professionals described him as realising that people weren't fully understanding what he was saying. Eventually, his speech would start to develop though, but more underlying issues were on the horizon. He was observed engaging in several repetitive behaviours, was sensitive to smells or sometimes smelt things that weren't there. He would also sit and hit his head repeatedly. Traits of OCD started to emerge. This led to an eventual diagnosis of sensory integration disorder. In other words, his brain had trouble receiving and responding to information that comes in through the senses, hence why he smelt smells that didn't necessarily exist. After this diagnosis, he continued to be monitored through his early days in kindergarten, although there's no in-depth reports about those years. So we'll fast forward to 1998, and Peter Lanza gets a job offer with with General Electric as a tax leader. He's quick to want to snap the job up, but it was 200 miles away in Stamford, Connecticut, meaning the Lancers would have to leave their current lives behind, leave their dream home, and start afresh, meeting new people and acquiring new friends. For the boys, it meant new schools. Nancy was in two minds about it. She felt like her marriage was at breaking point. Peter had been working non-stop, and she had took the role as a stay-at-home mum. Adam consumed her life. However, after researching the school systems in Connecticut and feeling it would be more suited to Adam's needs, she decided it was for the best. In the summer of 98, the Lancers were ready to settle down in a village they now called home, Sandy Hook. Both Adam and Ryan would attend Sandy Hook Elementary after the relocation. Adam would go on to be monitored until the fourth grade, where he was eventually described as being up to academic level for his age, and his speech had improved massively with the help of speech therapy within the school. By this point, though, he was still described as being shy and withdrawn, but there were moments where he would socialise with other children. He would get involved. Peter and Nancy also had broke up around this time, but wouldn't divorce until a later date. The breakup was initially hard on the boys, but eventually they learned to live with it after the schedule ended up being the same. Peter had worked that much, he would normally see the boys on the weekend anyway, and that continued. Two drastic events would take place in Adam's life in the following year. Depending on who you ask, one of those was a major red flag. In fifth grade, Adam made a best friend, and the pair would go on to author a book. The Big Book of Granny. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourself, maybe this was a book about an innocent grandma. Well, if you didn't guess it by now, it was the complete opposite. The truth was much darker. The Big Book of Granny, in a nutshell, consisted of narration about murdering children, cannibalism, and taxidermy of humans, amongst other topics not usually spoken of by a child in the fifth grade. However, it should be noted that various sources do say the book was created via some sort of school project, and it mustn't have been that much of concerned because everyone knew about the book, as Peter was quoted years later as saying Adam was trying to sell copies to other children. Adam was optimistic about attending middle school, but in reality, this is where major issues really started to begin. Reports say that Adam gave up several activities and hobbies that he either took up in his first year of middle school or that he did previously. He became more reserved and wouldn't leave the house. He even declared that he didn't want to celebrate holidays anymore, including his birthday. What was supposed to be a huge leap forward in life for Adam proved quite the opposite, and this was the result of the change in circumstances regarding school. His anxiety levels went through the roof due to social aspects of the classroom. That would, in turn, distract him from his course, causing him to fall behind with his homework. He was also reluctant to ask questions as he felt it would slow the class down, and he sensed resentment when that happened. Nancy believed Adam was bullied, so did Peter, although he would later come out to say he was never actually informed of any bullying incidents that took place. Rather, his speculation was because of the person he became. He thought he could have been an easy target for bullies. Either way, middle school was hell for Adam. He was eventually moved on to a Catholic school. It had smaller classes, it was more tailored to his way of learning, and to start, it was great. However, within one year, he was removed from the school, but it isn't clear whether this was Nancy or the school's decision. What should be noted, though, is that Adam continued to write similar stories to that of the Big Book of Granny. One 
teacher described his writings as this. I remember giving creative writing assignments to students, instructing them to write a page or two on whatever they wanted to talk about. Adam would write 10 pages obsessing about battles, destruction and war. I've known 7th grade boys to talk about things like this, but Adam's level of violence was disturbing. I remember showing the writings to the principal at the time and Adam's creative writing was so graphic that it couldn't be shared. This time, it doesn't seem as if anyone was informed of the writings, it would only later come out that he had produced the work. Peter said he was left in the dark. A decision was made to enrol Adam back to his previous middle school and he would attend, but only a few days into it, it was reported that he wasn't sleeping well and wasn't eating. He would be taken to hospital but was eventually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome by Dr. Paul Fox. He visited Dr. Fox away from that specific hospital appointment briefly after. On the basis he was diagnosed with Asperger's, Dr. Fox declared that no school environment would be suitable for his condition. He was a severe case as he put it, and so homeschooling was given the green light by Dr. Fox. For the rest of his time at middle school, Adam would now be homeschooled, although he did leave the house to attend Newtown High's tech club meetings, and of course visits to Dr. Fox. From the outside looking in, everything seemed fine and dandy. But the truth of the matter is that Adam, in certain aspects, was getting worse. You see, although he did go out from time to time, the majority of his day consisted of staying indoors, where he immersed himself in the gaming world of World of Warcraft. The blinds were up to block the sunlight. This would eventually turn into black bags, which completely blocked the sunlight out altogether, and his OCD had developed further. Requests of cloth washing every hour were made. Socks were the worst, and at times as many as 20 pairs of socks were worn per day. He also washed his hands that much that the skin began to peel from them. But remember, only certain aspects of his life were getting worse. Surprisingly, when moving on to high school, he was ready to try and make the step to attend rather than being homeschooled. At the end of his final middle school year, a dance ceremony was held as a sort of rite of passage, a goodbye to the teachers that guided students through those years of learning. But Adam wasn't allowed to attend. So Nancy and Peter purchased the home version of Dance Dance Revolution for his PlayStation 2, complete with a plastic mat that he could spread out on his bedroom floor. It looked similar to an arcade setup, and he was free to dance whenever he wanted. Either way, this step towards high school was growing ever closer, and Dr. Fox was pessimistic about the idea. Many others, however, were supportive. In order for this to work, though, a plan was laid out, and in simple forms, it consisted of Adam avoiding as many people as he could, attending high school either earlier or later, depending on the circumstance. He would then return home and delve deeper into the online world. The earliest reported findings of Adam's online history date back to late 2006. Here we see Adam's interest in mass murderers grow, and although he wouldn't directly engage with the various forum boards until late 2009, he definitely was a regular visitor to the sites. In late 2009, he would sign up to the Shocked Beyond Belief forum board, better known as the Super Columbine Massacre RPG, under the alias Smiggles, a forum dedicated to the Columbine killers and the phenomenon of mass shooters. One of his first posts announced that he had been using the board since late 2006, but hadn't made an account until recent. Throughout 2009, his interest peaked in relation to similar topics. Under the alias at Canebred, he signed up to various gun-related forums where he spoke of AK-47 types, AR-15 parts, having a fetish for a specific type of firearm, his preferred weapons loadout to four combat arms, amongst other things. He also made an account on Wikipedia under the same alias where he would edit and write up articles about mass shooting events. Confirmed edits throughout 2009 were the Dawson College shooting, the Collier Township shooting, the Luby's massacre, the West Roads Mall mass shooting, along with posts about mass killers Kip Kinkle and Larry Jean Ashbrook. In 2010, similar edits were made in relation to the Cello Mall shooting and mass murderer Richard Farley, but no other specific edits in relation to mass murderers or mass murder events were ever posted past early 2010. From the information that we currently have anyway. Moving forward, his online activity focused heavily on firearm-related topics, but it's thought he'd still been researching and gained information surrounding various mass murderers. Adam's obsession with mass killers was clear to see. Of course, no one from the outside knew what was going on, but had they seen the 7x4-foot-sized spreadsheet 
listing around 500 mass murderers, they would have knew what his mindset was straight away. The list consisted of the killer's stats, including the number of casualties, category of weapons used, he was careful to list every single weapon, and of course the shootings were ranked by the kills they had acquired. In 2011, Adam would call into Anarchy Radio, an anti-civilization show where he would appear to sympathise with Travis the Chimp, and compares the chimp to that of a mass shooter. Travis the Chimp was a chimpanzee that had been domesticated and raised like a human child. In February of 2009, he attacked and mauled his owner's friend, blinding her severing several body parts and lacerating her face before being shot and killed by responding police officers. Here we go. Hello. We get the collapsible headphones here, but uh, we're back. Sorry, right, we got Greg on the phone. Oh, Greg. Okay. How's it going? Oh, hi, good. Um, I'm a fan of your writing. Um, Thank you. I'm Thank sorry you to mess up such an old news story, but... I couldn't find anything that you said about the topic, and it seems relevant to your interest, so I thought I'd bring up Travis the Chimp. Do you remember him? I don't. Well, um, he was a highly domesticated chimpanzee who lived in a suburban home in Stamford, Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Oh. And he was raised just like a human child starting from the week he was born. By the time that he was 14 years old, which would be somewhere around age 20 in human years, uh -huh. um, he slept in a bed. He took his own baths, he dressed himself, he brushed his teeth with an electric toothbrush. <laughs> really? When was this? Um, well, this happened in early 2009. Oh. Oh. Um, uh -huh. He ate his meals at a table and enjoyed human foods like ice cream. And he used a remote control to watch television and liked baseball games. And he even used a computer to look at pictures on the internet. Huh. And... It goes without saying that Travis was very overweight. He was 200 pounds when he should have been around the low hundreds. Mm -hmm. And he was actually taking Xanax. Amazing. I couldn't find any information about why he was taking it, but it just seems to say a lot that he was giving it at all. And basically, I think Travis wasn't really any different than a mentally handicapped human child. Hmm. But anyway, one day in February 2009, he was acting very agitated, and at some point, grabbed the car, his owner's car keys, went outside and started beeping from car to car, apparently wanting to go for a car ride. And he was acting very aggressively, so his owner called her friend over to get her to help him to calm down and go back inside. And once she arrived, he immediately attacked her, and his owner tried to stop him, but couldn't, and she even resorted to stabbing him with a knife, but nothing worked. And she said that after she stabbed him, he looked at her as if to say, why'd you do that to me, Mom? Because apparently that was what their relationship was like, no different than between a human mother and a human child. So hmm. after the stabbing, she called the police, who arrived 12 minutes after the attack, at which point her friend was pretty close to dead. And once the cruiser came up, Travis went over to it, tried to open the locked passenger door, he smashed off the side view mirror, went over to the driver's door, opened it, and the cop shot him. He fled back into the house where he went to his playroom and bled to death. Hmm. And um, this might not seem very relevant, but I'm bringing it up because afterward, everyone was condemning his owner for saying how irresponsible she was for raising a chimp like it was a child and that she should have known something like this would happen because chimps aren't supposed to be living in civilization. They're supposed to be living in the wild among each other. Mm -hmm. But their criticism stops there, and the implication is that there's no way anything could have gone wrong in his life if he had been living in civilization as a human rather than a chimp. Ah, uh, indeed. So in Travis, um, because he brings up questions about this whole process of child raising. Um, yeah isn't something which just happens to gently exist without us having to do anything because every newborn child, human child, is born in a chimp-like state and civilization is only sustained by conditioning them for years on end so that they'll accept it for what it is. And since we've gone through this conditioning, we can observe a human family raising a human child and I'm sure that even you have trouble intuitively seeing it as something unnatural. But when we see a chimp in that position, we visually know that there's something profoundly wrong with the situation. And it's easy to say there's something wrong with it simply because it's a chimp. But what's 
the real difference between us and our closest relatives. Travis wasn't an untamed monster at all. Um, he wasn't just feigning domestication. He was civilized. Um, he was able to integrate into society. He was a chimp actor when he was younger, and his owner drove him around the city frequently in association with her towing business where he met many different people and got along with everyone. If Travis had been some nasty monster all his life, it would have been widely reported, but to the contrary, it seems like everyone who knew him said how shocked they were that Travis had been so savage because they knew him as a sweet child. And there were two isolated incidents early in his life when he acted aggressively, but summarizing them would take too long, so basically I'll just say that he didn't act really any differently than a human child would, and the people who would use that as an indictment against having chimps live as humans do wouldn't apply the same thing to humans, so it's just kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But anyway, look what civilization did to him. It had the same exact effect on him as it has on humans. He was profoundly sick in every sense of the term, and he had to resort to these surrogate activities like watching baseball and looking at pictures on a computer screen and taking Xanax. He was a complete mess. Mm -hmm. And his attack wasn't simply because he was a senselessly violent, impulsive chimp, um, which was how his behavior was universally portrayed. Um, immediately before his attack, he had desperately been wanting his owner to drive him somewhere. And the best reason I can think of for why he would want that, looking at his entire life, would be that some little thing he experienced was the last straw, and he was overwhelmed by the life that he had, and he wanted to get out of it by changing his environment, and the best way that he knew how to deal with that was by getting his owner to drive him somewhere else. Yeah. And when his owner's, owner's friend arrived, he knew that she was trying to coax him back into his life of domestication, and he couldn't handle that, so he attacked her and anyone else who approached him. And dismissing his attack as simply being the senseless, violent impulsiveness of a chimp instead of a human is wishful thinking at best. Mm -hmm. His attack can be seen entirely parallel to the attacks, the random acts of violence that you bring up on your show every week, mm. committed by humans, which the mainstream also has no explanation for. And no. An actual human, I just, just don't think it would be such a stretch to say that he very well could have been a teenage mall shooter or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And wow. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. That's quite a story. Yeah, that's uh, really apropos, isn't it? Travis yeah. the Chimp. It's just that I'm a little surprised that I never heard you bring it up at all because maybe I'm just seeing connections where there aren't any, but... Not, I think not. No, I just... I didn't catch that one. I didn't... Uh, maybe I was out of the country or something. I don't know, but I missed it. Thanks very much, man. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Wow. Very well articulated, I think. The link between the caller, Greg, and Adam Lanza was made after Smiggles had posted about Travis the Chimp on Shocked Beyond Belief. I should call into John Zerzan's radio program about Travis. I'm really surprised that I haven't been able to find anything he's written or said about the incident. Considering how often he brings up random acts of violence, it seems like Travis would be a poster chimp of his philosophy. Smiggles, aka Adam Lanza, would go on to make this comment after the call. Well, I feel schizophrenic. My call starts at 38 minutes. It didn't go as horribly as I anticipated. I wish I hadn't spoken non-stop about Travis for so long, but I didn't want to seem crazy by randomly bringing up a chimpanzee for unknown reasons. And despite my failed attempt at having a normal voice, I at least sounded less incoherent than usual. I normally speak much softer and swifter with less articulation, less inflection, and more mumbling. Away from his online activity and rewinding the clock back a few years to 2008, it was reported that Adam had stopped seeing all medical professionals in relation to his disorders and moving forward that would stay permanent. He would soon be integrated back into a normal class after it was assessed he was doing well and although he still suffered with certain conditions, the rest of his school life was relatively normal so to speak. And in June of 2009, he would graduate from Newtown High School with a diploma so it was time for him to gear up for college. 
Although the end of school went fairly well for Adam, he dropped out of his first year of college, but it isn't exactly clear as to why that was. From emails later recovered by the FBI, Nancy Lanza had spoke to Peter in regards to an incident that had happened. She couldn't figure out what it was specifically, rather Adam's reaction to it resulted in muteness, him covering his face, and he went straight to his room, where he stayed for hours without eating. He had dropped out only one month after securing his diploma, and as you know, throughout that specific summer, he continuously posted about mass murderers. Take from that what you will. Details are hazy as to what happened for the following year, but in September of 2010, Adam wanted to join the Army Rangers. However, Peter thought this goal was unrealistic. In the end, Peter's thoughts about the situation proved true. Adam never joined up, rather took on some new courses at Newark Community College. Peter and Adam would end up having a heated back and forth about how many courses Adam could take on. He wanted to take on five, but Peter thought a Again, this was unrealistic. This right here, ladies and gentlemen, would mark the end to the pair's relationship. Moving forward, they'd never speak again. Peter attempted to reach out various times after this point, but Adam never responded. By the end of the year, Ryan had moved out of the house due to work in New York City, meaning now it was just Nancy and Adam within the family unit. The pair would bond over their love of guns, and for Adam to travel with Nancy to the shooting range throughout 2010 and 2011 showed his passion for it, given his medical history. But these trips would soon end, as it was reported that for months, Adam and Nancy, although living in the same property, only communicated via email. Away from Nancy though, Adam had actually started to socialise with an acquaintance from Newark Community College. He had managed to pass his driving test a couple of years prior and every weekend would attend the local movie theatre where he would play Dance Dance Revolution with this acquaintance. He went there so frequent he was known as the Dance Dance Revolution guy. He would dance on for hours, sometimes 10 hours at a time, his clothes drenched in sweat. Yeah, it does. I'm probably going to be on the left of us. Swag. On the 13th of December 2012, the GPS unit in Adam Lanza's vehicle logged that from 9.09 until 9.32am, he had turned right off of Riverside and drove past Dickinson Drive, the entry to Sandy Hook Elementary School. He continued for approximately half a mile before pulling off onto Chimney Swift Drive before turning around and following the same route back home to Yoganda Street. On this day, there was no indication that he had entered the school grounds. At roughly 10 p.m., Nancy would return home from her Thanksgiving trip in New Hampshire. She went back to her family's farm where she once lived. They caught up, it was a laugh, but it was time to return to reality, to return to Adam, and that's exactly what she did. Upon arriving through the front door, she took a shower, planned an appointment with her friend for a dress fitting, read a book, and went to sleep. The next morning, sometime before 9am, a neighbour who lived on the same street as Adam and Nancy heard what sounded like three or four rifle shots, one after another. The shots did sound unusually close, but he figured it was just a hunter out in the woods who had lost their way. Sadly, the reality was much more darker, and the events that unfolded on the 14th of December 2012 would not only shock the local community of Newtown, 
but the entire United States and beyond. And once again, I'm Diane Sawyer here at ABC News headquarters in New York. We're coming back on the air with the breaking news. New reports about the casualties in that shooting at the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. And I want to go straight to ABC's Pierre Thomas because he's learned more about how many may have been injured and may not have made it. Pierre. Diane, we're being told by multiple state and federal sources that unfortunately more than a dozen people have been shot and killed at that school, and that number includes children. It does include children, and again, we have heard reports of casualties of some of the adults in the front office, but uh, Pierre, how, how strong is this news? How, how much can we say to people that, that we know that it has reached this shattering level? Well, the situation is very fluid, but we have been very careful to try to talk to as many different sources as we can from multiple agencies. And again, from state, federal uh, sources, we are being told that more than a dozen shot and killed at the school. Uh, obviously, the parents and, and the school community will be notified uh, as additional information comes in. But my sources are just devastated. Uh, they're calling it a tragedy of epic proportions. All right, Pierre, thank you. And of course, we know there are also people in the hospital that right now they have been taken into emergency rooms where doctors are working to make sure that no more lives are lost. But some of them are seriously injured. The gunman confirmed dead, as we said earlier. And we will keep you posted throughout the day on this crushing event at the elementary school in Connecticut. And one of the parents recently told me that as the children were walked out of the school by their teachers, some of them were told to cover their eyes as they walked and just hold on to each other. We will have full reports throughout the day. We are always there, of course, at abcnews.com. And I will see you again on World News tonight. In the days leading up to the 14th of December 2012, Adam Lanza had reportedly visited the Sandy Hook Elementary School website various times. In retrospect, we can see that he was more than likely searching up the final step of his plans. On the 14th, he was ready to execute them. Sometime before 9.30am, 20-year-old Adam Lanza shot his mother Nancy four times in the head while she slept. The mother who spent her life trying to do the best by Adam in the matter of seconds had her life taken by him. The four shots Peter said represented a bullet for each member in the family, Nancy, Peter, Ryan and Adam. He was sure that had both he and Ryan been home at the time of the initial shooting, they too would have been killed. Following the shooting at the house, Adam made his way over to Sandy Hook Elementary in his Honda Civic. He was armed to the teeth. In his possession was a 12-gauge semi-automatic shotgun, a semi-automatic rifle, and two semi-automatic handguns. He had also taken 24 magazines in total. They were full, two for the shotgun, 10 for the semi-automatic rifle, and 6 magazines each for both pistols. The route Adam had taken to the school was exactly the same as he had done the day before. Moments before 9.35am, he arrived but decided for whatever reason to leave the shotgun along with the two magazines in the car. Dressed in military style gear, although it wasn't actually body armour, he placed his earplugs in and was ready to unleash a wave of violence that had been all too familiar in modern day America. To start, he pulled back the charging handle on the AR-15 and fired a single round into the pavement to make sure the magazine was inserted properly. He swiftly moved on to the entrance, but the door was locked, and so shots were fired in a glass panel so he could enter. Some of those initial shots were heard as the school intercom had been rolling for morning announcements. Principal Dawn Hoshbrong and the school psychologist Mary Sherlock were meeting with other faculty members in a staff room when they heard but didn't immediately recognise the gunshots. The pair, along with lead teacher Natalie Hammond, stepped into the hall to determine the source of the sound when out of nowhere they encountered none other than Adam Lanza. Witnesses say all three shouted, Shooter, stay put, which thankfully would save multiple staff members' lives and in turn would save pupils' lives. The school janitor Rick Thorne would yell, Put the gun down. Instead, Adam opened fire, killing both Dawn and Mary. Natalie had been shot in the leg and sustained a further gunshot wound. She instantly dropped to the ground, pretended to play dead, 
and when everything went silent, she crawled to the conference room and pressed her body against the door to keep it closed. From here, Adam made his way towards the room where the faculty meeting was being held. More staff were inside, but they were hiding. According to those members of staff who hid, he did enter but couldn't see anyone, so he made his way out, and it was now open season on the classrooms. The closest classroom was that of classroom 12, but there had been a dark coloured paper covering the door's glass pane from the inside. It had been left by accident after a recent recent lockdown drill. Uncertain over who or what was on the other side of the door may have been the reason he decided to skip. There's conflicting reports about Adam's next moves from here, but the facts are that he entered classroom 8 and 10. For sake of this video, we'll say that he went to classroom 8 first. Room 8 was a classroom of first graders taught by Lauren Rasu and Rachel Davino. Rachel had been a substitute teacher only one week at that point, as she was working with a special needs child. Everyone in that classroom would fall victim, leaving only one child as a survivor. According to ballistics reports, the whole class had attempted to take refuge in the bathroom, but because it wasn't big enough to keep all 15 students in, along with the two teachers, the door had stayed slightly open. Sadly, Adam had noticed, walked up to the door and fired continuously. Witnesses to this particular part of the shooting heard a young boy shout, help me, I don't want to be here, to which Adam responded, well, you're here. A six-year-old girl would survive this part of the shooting. She would eventually be found by police in the classroom following the events that had unfolded. She had hid right in the corner of the bathroom, only surviving after playing dead. Adam would then make his way to room 10. Victoria Lee Soto had been teaching her first grade class along with Anne-Marie Murphy the special education teacher working with special needs students within Victoria's class. Upon hearing the commotion, Victoria and Anne hid some of the students in the bathroom whilst others were told to hide under desks, but she forgot to lock the classroom door. They were panicked. In a moment's notice, she remembered she hadn't locked it, so she made her way to the door, but as she did, Adam walked in. From here, he walked to the back of the classroom, saw the children under the desks and shot them. First grader Jesse Lewis shouted at his surviving classmates to run for safety, and several of them did. He went on to save multiple lives at just the age of six years old, a true hero. He'd been staring Adam in the face while shouting, but in the end, he was sadly fatally shot. After six minutes of terror and going into classrooms he'd already shot up in a confusion, Adam had killed 26 and 7 year olds along with 6 teachers. As the police started to approach the school, he would pull out one of his handguns and shot himself dead. On the 25th of November 2013, the final report from the state attorney summarising the investigation concluded that Adam Lanza had acted alone and that the case was closed. The report noted that Adam was familiar with firearms and ammunition and had an obsession with mass murderers but didn't identify a specific motive for the shooting. They did say, however, the shooting and eventual suicide wasn't a spare-of-the-moment action. Rather, it had been planned months, if not years, in advance. His hard drive had been destroyed, the FBI would never gain access to what was on it, but archived internet history painted a picture of a young man who hated society that surrounded him, and evidently he engaged in various conversations about his obsessions. There are many theories out there in regards to a motive. One that people believe is the closest to the truth is that Adam Lanza was a paedophile. In an undated and lengthy essay, he outlined his position that paedophilia should not be considered abhorrent or illegal. This was further backed up by a YouTube channel that was found in 2021 by a user on Reddit. In the videos, which some label Adam Lanza's basement tapes, opinions that he previously held via text form were spoken of. Although this theory is one that's widely accepted, at least by internet detectives, officially we still don't know why Adam did what he did that day. What also should be noted is that although the FBI are aware of at least the essay that he wrote, they don't believe Adam being a paedophile led him to kill all of those innocent people.